Heart Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing our series called Understanding the Jews. This is now lesson number 205, and tonight's lesson is entitled Ahab and Jezebel, part 20. So last week, we finished following the path that God took in leading us to the places and the timing of the three men that Elijah was told to anoint, men that God would use for the purpose of executing judgment on Israel and on the house of Ahab. And that journey took us back and forth between the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, uh, but tonight we're back in 1 Kings, and right after the Bible goes through the calling of Elisha, we will see events rapidly developing that do not bode well for Israel. In the next chapter of 1 Kings, chapter 20, our attention is directed to one of Israel's most persistent enemies, the nation of Syria. And we will see how the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, had set his sights on capturing the capital city of Samaria. Now, this particular battle is something that I covered before. It was actually about a year and a half ago, probably closer to two years, back in Lessons 115 and 116. At that time, I chose to review the circumstances of this battle because there was, well, an unusual similarity between how King Ahab answered the boasting of Ben-Hadad and how David answered the boasting of that Philistine giant, Goliath. So, since this battle has been addressed earlier, there is a temptation to skip over Ben-Hadad's first attempt to defeat Ahab and just move right on to the second. But, because it's been so long, and because this episode provides some needed context to Ahab's overall time as king, I decided not to skip it. So we'll go ahead and review it again for a second time. And as, like Pastor Brock likes to remind me, repetition is not the enemy of learning. It's actually an aid to learning. So I'm going to take some comfort in that, even though it still gives me some agita. And for you A-plus Bible students out there who remember everything I said the last time, I'm going to add a little more detail the second time around. So let's begin with the first verse. That's 1 Kings 20 and verse number 1. Scripture reads, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his host together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses, and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. So here we have this man called Ben-Hadad, who was the king of Syria. And first off, we need to understand that Ben-Hadad is not a proper name, as in a birth name. In Hebrew, Ben-Hadad means the son of Hadad. And since I never miss an opportunity to make a reference to my favorite movie, Ben-Hur, <laughs> I'll go ahead and do it now. The main character in that movie was Judah Ben-Hur, meaning Judah, son of Hur. And that's the meaning here in 1 Kings 20 and verse 1. But that meaning has a twist. And the twist is that the Syrians in that period of time we're using the name Ben-Hadad as a title. A title that denoted a particular person as king. And there were at least 
three different men who reigned over Syria using that same title. Just as men during the Roman Empire used the title Caesar, and the kings of Egypt used the title of Pharaoh. They were adopting a title. And in the case before us, we observe that such men were using that idea that they were the sons of Hadad. And Hadad was the principal god of the Syrians, small g. And just like the pharaohs of Egypt, they too saw themselves as a god. And that little bit of background will come into play because men who believe themselves to be a god will act with a certain level of arrogance that often gets them into trouble. So, Ben-Hadad, actually possibly could have been Ben-Hadad II, had assembled this huge confederacy of lesser kings. Of course, these so-called kings would have been more like mayors of cities or governors of a distinct political area, geographical and political area, within or adjacent to Syria proper. But any way that we want to describe them, they did in fact constitute a vast multitude and an overwhelming force as compared to whatever Ahab had at his disposal. And this great army came and positioned itself outside of the city of Samaria. Now it gets a little confusing because Samaria we know is also called a land but within that land of Samaria, there is a capital city of Samaria. We do the same thing here. We have New York, New York, Kansas City, Kansas, etc. And it's not something that we have never heard of. Now, Ben Haydad had a pretty accurate picture of where he stood. He got the lay of the land. And to put it lightly, oh, he knew he was in a position of strength. And he believed with good cause that just the very sight of his army would cause Ahab to think about nothing other than total surrender. And so Ben-Hadad acted in accordance with his assessment of the situation. So let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 20 and look at verses 2 and 3. The scripture reads, and he, Ben-Hadad, sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also, and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. So, in his sense of superiority and arrogance, Ben-Hadad sent what can only be considered an insolent demand. A demand and a claim that would have been unmistakable to King Ahab. Ben-Hadad was already viewing Ahab as being a defeated person. He was laying claim to whatever wealth was in Ahab's possession. And in Oriental culture, one of the first acts of one who has conquered is to seize the wives of a defeated monarch. And if you recall, well, that's what King David's son Absalom did during his rebellion to show the people that he had displaced his father on the throne. He took his wives. King Ahab was being asked to acknowledge his subservience to Ben-Hadad. And in order to acquire peace, Ahab was required and expected to comply with his demand 
forthwith. Meaning, send out your gold and your silver. Oh, and send out your wives and your children. Now, we don't know how many wives they have actually had. We know he had quite a few, besides Jezebel, of course. We only know <clears throat> for sure that he had more than one. His children, on the other hand, were another story. According to First Kings, I'm sorry, Second Kings 10.1, Ahab had at least 70 sons and an unknown number of daughters. So the total number of wives and sons and daughters had to be well over a hundred, more than a hundred people. So, what was Ben-Hadad going to do with his entire family? Well, he had just claimed them all as his personal property. So the short answer is that he could do whatsoever he wanted to do with them. And most of the options would not be conducive to a happy result. Ben Hadad was playing hardball. So what was Ahab going to do? Back to the scriptures. 1 Kings 20 and verse number 4. The scripture reads, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine, and all that I have. <clears throat> now, this response from Ahab seems to fit the impression that we already have concerning his lack of character and his weak spine. His answer is shameful, cowardly, despicable. But more than anything, Ahab wanted to save his own skin. And Ahab understood Ben-Hadad's demand to be the price he would have to pay for peace. It was a quid pro quo. You give me what I ask, I'll give you peace. I'll spare you, Ahab, and withdraw my army from Samaria. And Ahab thought that the price he was asking was something he could live with. Never mind the horrors that would await his family at the hands of a ruthless enemy. Now, most fathers have a natural tendency that would cause them to risk their own lives to protect their wives and their children. It's just a natural thing, not Ahab. So in his response, he doesn't call Ben Hadad out for his cruel request, but instead, well, he graciously addresses him as his master. He says, My Lord, O King. And Ahab's reply is in agreement with Ben Hadad that he himself, Ahab that is, is a, is a servant before him. And that everything that Ben-Hadad has asked for is in fact his and shall be turned over. Now, I did mention that we've talked about this incident before. And it was back when we were studying the fight between David and Goliath. And we did it because the way that Ahab spoke to Ben-Hadad we said it was very similar to the way that King Ahab spoke to Ben-Hadad. In fact, I'm sorry, it would be David and Goliath. I'm using the same names twice. In fact, we made the observation that it was probably Ahab's finest hour. 
But here's the thing. Before Ahab had that finest hour, oh, he had one of his worst. Now, we know that Ahab had a lot of them, but this particular one was a bad one for sure. One of the worst, if not the worst. So obviously you're getting the idea by now that the story doesn't end here. And you are right. King Ahab thought that agreeing to Ben-Hadad's demands represented a deal. They had a deal. The terms of a peace treaty had been met. And now the hostilities would cease. In effect, the war would be over. This was Ahab's grand attempt at appeasement. If he just appeased Ben-Hadad's desires, well, Ben-Hadad would be satisfied and everything would be cool. Everything would be copacetic. But Ben-Hadad was a bully. And when you give a bully what he asked for without a fight, what does he usually do? He asks for more. Let's go to 1 Kings 20, verses 5 and 6. The scripture reads, And the messengers, this is Ben-Hadad's messengers, And the messengers came again, and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver, and thy gold, and thy wives, and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house, and the houses of thy servants. And it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. So, Ahab's capitulation to Ben-Hadad's demands goes back to him by way of his messengers. And they report, well, King Ahab has agreed to your terms. And here we see that Ben-Hadad's response, well, it doesn't seem to be in accordance with Ahab's expectations, does it? But what we read in verse 6, oh, it's obvious what Ben-Hadad was thinking. He thought, wow, that was easy. In fact, that was too easy. No counteroffer. No attempt to negotiate something a little less harsh? Man, Ahab is even weaker than I thought. I think I need to up the ante. I think there's more to be had here. So, Ben-Hadad decides that, well, there's no deal after all. He went back to the well, and when he did, he added an extra dose of humiliation. He wanted to rub the situation in Israel's faces, and he wanted them to grovel before him. It's funny how these guys are. Notice that Ben-Hadad's servants were not to take everything that was pleasant in their own eyes, no, not in their eyes, but everything that was pleasant or precious in Ahab's eyes. That's how you know this was meant to humiliate. Even if there were items that they themselves didn't even want, if it was an item that meant something to Ahab or to his people, then they were to take it. So now what? Well, now Ahab has a big problem. 
It's one thing to agree to give up what was his. But now, Ben-Hadad wants Ahab to allow his servants to go through all of the houses of the principal people of the city, the aristocracy. And he has allowed them, he is to allow them, to root through all their stuff and to take whatever they want. Well, as powerful as the king was, there were certain limitations as to how far he could go. And this may have been a bridge too far. If he agreed to that, he may not have to worry about Ben-Hadad killing him. His own people may have done it. So Ahab realizes that he needs to have a conference call. And we'll find that in the next two verses. 1 Kings 20, verses 7 and 8. The scripture reads, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives, and for my children, and for my silver, and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. So Ahab tells this group of leaders, group of elders, what he had already agreed to. But he didn't mention the new terms that Ben-Hadad was demanding. Before he could even get to them, the elders seemed to be shocked that he agreed to Ben-Hadad's first set of demands. He said, don't do it. All of the elders. And everybody present said, no way. No way are we going to agree to such a thing. Don't listen to him at all. And don't agree to any of it. Now, we aren't told directly if Ahab then went on to explain the additional demands made by Ben-Hadad to this assembly of elders. But in Ahab's reply, he definitely gave that impression to Ben-Hadad. In keeping with Ahab's normal modus operandi, he may well have wanted to convince these elders to agree with the intrusion of their homes by Ben-Hadad's servants. But when he saw that they were adamantly opposed to the first deal that he attempted to make, there was really no need to even get into the new demands. Now, maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. But he did want Ben-Hadad to get that impression, the impression that his hands were tied that he desired to give Ben-Hadad what he wanted, but he just couldn't get the agreement of his advisors. Let's go to 1 Kings 20, verse number 9. And the scripture reads, Wherefore, this is Ahab speaking, he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, all that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. So what's going on here? Looks like Ahab was hoping that he could get some sympathetic understanding from Ben-Hadad as one king to another. Surely, as king, Ben-Hadad would have been in similar situations himself. And perhaps, being informed of Ahab's difficulty, he would be satisfied with the original deal that they had made. 
but it looks like Ahab wasn't being straight in representing the outcome of that conference that he had. He didn't mention that the elders were not in agreement with even the first deal. He didn't do that because Ahab was ready to override their wishes about that first deal. But, if his advisors weren't even happy with that, he knew they were not going to even entertain the idea of that second deal. That was the bridge too far. That one that would have included the ransacking of their personal residences. So that second demand was the one that Ahab focused on. He was still hoping and trying to salvage this peace deal. So it appears that while the elders didn't like Ahab offering his gold and silver and his family as a price for peace, in that conference, Ahab read the room, he must have. And he thought he could get them to swallow that much. But the one thing he did know beyond that was that he was not going to get that second demand passed then. It wasn't going to happen. So Ahab was hoping that the two kings could return to that original bargain. And so he waited for Ben-Hadad's answer. And when it came... This is what Ben-Hadad had to say. 1 Kings 20 and verse 10. And the scripture reads, And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me and more also. If the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. So I think we can attribute a pretty strong rejection to Ahab's proposal. There was no sympathy given to Ahab's predicament at all. Ben-Hadad was livid that his demands were not accepted in full without any amendments. And while his phrase about the dust of Samaria has been interpreted in several different ways, it all boils down to essentially the same meaning. Namely, this. He's telling Ahab, you have no chance, Ahab. You're in no position to do anything other than offer total surrender. And if you don't, there won't be enough left of your city to provide even a handful of ashes for each of my soldiers. So now Ahab gets this extremely belligerent answer from Ben-Hadad. And Ben-Hadad is supremely confident that having been sufficiently warned of the dire consequences, Ahab will knuckle under. He will fall in line. And we know that's how Ben-Hadad felt because after dispensing his messengers, he immediately went back to his pavilion and began drinking himself into a drunken stupor. Well, Ben Haydad has now thrown down the gauntlet. And any thought of further negotiations is now out the window. It's time to put up or shut up. What will Ahab do now? Let's go to 1 Kings 20 and verse 11. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. So here it is. As promised. We have at last 
Ahab's finest hour. It took a while, but he finally got there. Yes, his life had been marked and will continue to be marked by consistent evil. But he did have this one moment. Now, these very brave words should, however, be tempered with the situation that he was in. I'm not going to give him full credit. <laughs> Ahab really had no place to go. The elders and the people were not going to allow him to agree to all of Ben-Hadad's demands. So given the circumstances, where was the downside for him to, once in his life, present himself as a courageous man? There really wasn't any. And so that's what he did. In similar fashion to how that Shepherd boy David responded to the boasting of Goliath. Now we're seeing King Ahab, of all people, responding to the boasting of Ben-Hadad in a very similar way. From the very first words of Ahab's reply, he was sending quite a different message to Ben-Hadad. In the previous two communications, Ahab had really given Ben-Hadad much deference. He addressed him on both of those occasions as, O oh Lord, my King, but not this time. There was no grand title offered. It was just, you go tell him, not Lord, not king, just him. You tell him that he shouldn't be talking like someone who is taking off his armor after the battle when he hasn't as yet put his armor on. He's telling Ben Hey Daddy he was getting out over his skis. His presumptions were just that presumptions. You haven't proved anything yet. And that's the answer that Ahab gave to Ben-Hadad's messengers to bring back. Now, considering Ahab's previous attitude, the one prior to the last ultimatum, what are the chances that Ben-Hadad was expecting an answer like this? A reply of bold defiance. Well, we're going to find out. 1 Kings 20 and verse 12. The scripture reads, And it came to pass, when Ben-Hadad heard this message, as he was drinking, he and the kings and the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. So Ahab's answer is nothing less than a slap in the face. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Ahab is essentially telling Ben Hadad, Ben Hadad, to stick his proposal in his ear. So here's Ben Hadad. He's in his party tent, drinking and carrying on with all those other leaders of his confederacy. The people that are supposed to be running the show. And now, all of a sudden, they have to deal to this unexpected turn of events. Ahab has stopped cooperating. Now we see a very familiar scene playing out with people who have had too much to drink. 
Instead of any intelligent and thoughtful planning, there is only a knee-jerk response. A response that Ben Haydad took because he was personally insulted. How dare he? Ben Haydad was hot. And in accordance with his rage, Ben Haydad immediately ordered his army to set themselves in array against the city. Now look, this was obviously not his original plan. The one he had made before he got into this condition. Because we've already read where the plan was to what? To lay siege to the city. And then wait. Wait until the people were weakened to the point that they would really no longer be able to offer any real resistance. And that siege plan was a common practice for good reason. Any attack on the fortified walls of a city, even with a greater force, was going to incur a great deal of casualties. Whereas, exercising the patience of a siege would substantially mitigate those casualties, those expected losses. But now, <laughs> that strategy was tossed aside. Ben Haydad had been insulted, and he was going to teach Ahab a thing or two. This is a good object lesson as to why you shouldn't mix making war with having a party. So Lord willing, <clears throat> next week, we will see how Ben Haydad's change in plan works out. And in the interim, please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.